Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Clara. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come on here and um, have a chat with us about your career and commercial property. You are very welcome. It's lovely <laughs> to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no problem. No problem. So first off, then, it would be great just to hear your story of your career so far, how you got to where you are now and where you where you started to think about a career in law. I have always wanted to be a lawyer ever since I can remember. So I applied for law degrees. I ended up going to the University of Kent at Canterbury uh, for both my undergraduate degree and my master's degree, which is therefore why I ended up doing my training contract at a little high street firm in Dover. Okay. Um, that was really interesting because, you know, it was all hands on deck. So I was able to get a really good grasp of client care and handling my own matters right from the get go. Um, they put me in residential conveyancing, but I'd sort of had that mark mastered really um, within sort of six months and decided that the challenge lay ahead in commercial property. I'd always loved property law at university. Um, unfortunately, where I trained, they already had two commercial property lawyers, so I couldn't stay there. Um, mm. Eventually, I relocated back to Norwich because I'm from Norfolk originally. Um, and I worked for Clapham and College for a bit in the city. Mm. Um, and then, of course, the crash happened in 09 and I sort of felt like the writing was on the wall because that's one of the, the issues with Comprop you're kind of mm -hmm. one of the first to feel it when there's anything like that so that's when I saw the position going at CBS Group PLC who were looking for a property manager and I thought you know I was only a few years PQE and I thought actually do you know what I can go and do that I can do it quite easily um, and then wait for all this to blow over and then move back into private practice mm. um, I have to say it was most bizarre I ended up having two interviews with CBS in the same day <laughs> um, okay yeah they they needed me to come back immediately uh, to talk to the CEO who was going away on holiday um, and I went and I did that uh, and we sort of had the conversation he said we've never had an in-house lawyer before I said well I've never been an in-house lawyer before <laughs> um, and I said right well we'll work it out and actually 10 years go by um, wow. and I've built up the legal team I've been um, appointed company secretary so I get to sit on the board and working in-house you it, it's anything and everything coming your way so whilst my role was primarily looking after their rapidly expanding leasehold portfolio of veterinary premises um, as well as doing all of the property due diligence on their acquisitions I mean we were doing three acquisitions a week at one point it was bonkers mm. um, obviously all the recent stuff in the vet industry is quite a change uh, from that point but do you know what it was one of the best career decisions I've ever made because you get in there you get hands-on with a business you get to see how they think how they tick how decisions are made what's important from mm. a property perspective and also you know whatever you do on acquisition you're picking up afterwards so it's that attention to detail you kind of get good at it because you know it's going to be your problem afterwards yeah I guess <laughs> you're never passing it on to someone else you're never like oh well that we're going to down the line we'll deal with that because that's you that's going to deal with it down the line absolutely absolutely but uh, so after almost 10 years I kind of decided I needed a change the company had grown substantially in that time I was getting further and further away from the sort of the day-to-day -day legal work that was my first love uh, mm. which is why I then decided to make a move and uh, join Pretties which has been absolutely fabulous five years this week since I joined uh, <laughs> exactly and you know they've been amazingly supportive um supported supported me through partnerships I've been a partner here since October 2022 and I'm absolutely loving it we're going through such an exciting time with the firm at the minute there's loads going on uh, and yeah it's it's a fabulous fabulous place to be Excellent, excellent. Well, there we go. Yeah, it's a, it's a say shows how different careers can be because having that path that you didn't plan at all, yeah, uh, through in house, which you didn't expect, and and here you are, sort of thing. So no, that's great. What would you say then? Obviously, like you said, property. I mean, I have to say, not many people love property at university. That's quite a rarity there. Yeah, it is. You need to be a certain kind of person. I just always loved it. I loved the intricacy of it. You know, it's like a big jigsaw puzzle. It's not one size fits all. Mm. I think from my perspective, if you want to be a commercial property lawyer you have to love the law because there is so much of it in this area you know and what we cover is so broad so it's landlord and tenant it's land agreements options overage development bit of agricultural you know it's mm. it's such a broad broad spectrum and if you like that if you like sort of getting involved and, and learning different areas with technicality um 
then this this is great for you. Um, I think you also need to be able to apply the law to the commercial realities of the situation mm -hmm. and provide sound advice. You know, you're acting for a developer or a commercial tenant of a building, uh, they're redeveloping, you know, you can spend hours sitting there drafting them a missive on the law and how that's mm -hmm. going to work. But actually, you need to take the law and apply it to the situation and give them that sound commercial guidance that they're looking for, mm -hmm. um, you know, because ultimately what they want is for that deal to be done. So yes, you need to be technically good, but you also need to be able to give the law a commercial application and come to resolutions that work for everybody. Um, I think lastly, you also need to uh, love coloring in <laughs> because we okay. pl plans are a daily part of our lives so coloring in the, and the red lines and the green lines yeah. and all that sort and, of thing and, and, and coloring yeah. in the lines you know is um is key but yeah i think uh, all of those things um make a good commercial property lawyer yeah yeah okay no that makes sense and i guess as well that's the advantage of you having been in-house is that you know the commercial need for that practical advice Completely. Um, you know, like you say, no, but I, I don't, I don't care about the law. I need the job to be done, you know, so it's the job done sort of attitude, which the, the, is so Yeah, prevalent. I mean, the, the law is always going to be key. It's always going to guide you in your decision making process. But the commercial risks are something that your client is probably used to dealing with on a day to day basis. Mm. It's not for us to say this is too risky for you. It's for us to say, look, here are the risks. This is how we can make it as as less risky as possible uh, and how we can help you or coming up with suggestions saying well actually have you considered doing it this way or what about this way you know mm -hmm. um and guiding them through that process i mean i always want to try and be that sort of um, in-house lawyer that's external you know that strategic person that actually mm. understands the client's business because that is absolutely the way to, to to get you know into a client's um, needs and wants and to give them that client care that they really need mm, mm, yeah absolutely no I can see that and so what do you think um, in terms of personality and that kind of thing, what do you think sort of suits the personality? Because obviously you've said about the complexity of the law and I can see that because I guess no situation is the same. So, you know. Yeah, it, it's it, you kind of need to be all things to all people. Um, I mean, we always talk about the difference between private client and, you know, commercial clients, mm. um, you know, and private clients, you know, family, residential conveyancing, estates, they have a particular way, you know, because their clients are need quite a lot of emotional support. Mm. When you're in the commercial sphere, it's very different. The clients expect you to be able to work at their pace. So yes, it might mean quite late nights and, you know, uh, working to deadlines because that's what you know the clients want and need but I also think that you have to be able to be frank and honest with your clients as well if they're trying to suggest a time scale or a structure that just simply isn't going to work or is going to present them with you know uh, mm -hmm. significant problems down the line you have to be forthright and say look yeah we can do that for you but this is the risk or it might not happen in time um, mm -hmm. you also have to be able to you know go up against a lot of the bigger firms which I do on a sort of daily basis you know these multinational massive London firms that have hordes of lawyers you know you're going to have to be that personality that goes actually no I think this and I'm, I'm going to argue my case and you know this amendment that you've made is just you know wholly unreasonable because mm -hmm. um, and be able to successfully argue that point no matter what size of firm you're in what resources you have so I think whilst there are really good commercial property lawyers that sort of sit in the background and do you know the drafting which as I've mentioned is really technical really highly skilled stuff I think you know for, for a career longevity you're going to have to need to be somebody that can handle the client meetings handle your mm. policies calls with the other side and really present the best possible position and argue the best possible position you know if mm. you're right so although we're although we're deemed a non-contentious area of law we do obviously regularly have to have these sort of conversations and mm. you know approaches um yeah throughout your, your negotiations everything. are going to be sometimes Absolutely. relatively contentious so yeah you're going to have to make your point and be a bit robust like you say to to come across in the right way and get the job done I guess as well absolutely mm -mm. no fair enough fair enough and um is there anything, any sort of personality wise, is there anything that you ever seen that really clashed with being a commercial property lawyer? Have you ever seen people sort of come into the field and it just just didn't gel with them for whatever reason? Or um, 
it's it's difficult to say because there you know the, there are many people that make up a good commercial property team as i've just said mm -hmm. so you'll have some people that are stronger in some areas than others um i think you know being being knowledgeable and being concise in terms of what you're doing and where you're going and how you're advising the clients is key i, I think if you're somebody that prefers to sort of sit quietly and write sort of long missives maybe this isn't the sort of dynamic area um that would mm, be for mm. you or if you are um somebody that approach you know perhaps favors the sort of softer approach to client care um mm. maybe a private client area might be better for you but if you're sort of up for a robust challenge and you're you know prepared to to, to drive forward and come up with innovative solutions then 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 that's the best i mean we've actually got um in our team uh paul who uh, does property development in his own capacity as well as being right. a commercial property lawyer so one of the things that works really well for him and his clients is that he can talk to them on their level because he's done it he's been mm, there mm. he's got spades on the ground he's done it so you know and again a bit like me i've sort of sat in a a business understood how decisions are made so again it's about making sure you're able to put yourself um in your client's shoes in order mm, to be able mm. to understand what they're trying to do and how to how to best help them and i think perhaps somebody that's maybe uh not quite as confident in doing that might struggle um mm, mm, in this yeah. area well like you say it's that robustness isn't it rather than sort of the bedside manner rather than the softly softly sort yeah. of bedside manner that you might use for the individual clients i think and i i often find that people know quite quickly in their career if they want to do sort of commercial client focus or individual client focus mm. and then then quite often the contentious or the non-contentious yeah sort of they know right away sort of thing it's quite a personality decision i think both of those Absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, I I do the, the very big deals, but I wouldn't want to go and do proper litigation. <laughs> <'cause that's scary. laughs> I much, you know, I much prefer sort of, uh, you know, the sort of the non contentious negotiation per se. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 you, you kind of and I think um, it's interesting because with the new SQE route into qualification uh actually we're seeing sort of trainees coming down that route sort of having or choosing uh not to actually move around departments um they obviously want to yes. you know they start in one team they focus in one team so um you know i would always encourage a trainee to try different areas to decide mm -hmm. what's right for them because you know it's a big decision and once you sort of qualify uh, and move into a particular area it's it can be quite difficult i mean i suppose the only difference would be maybe residential and commercial there's a little bit of a crossover on the yeah. basis that we do uh, act for developers and have some residential plot sales and sort of setting up the contracts and transfers for for those clients is you know quite akin to resi we've had great success uh in one of our trainees coming in uh who'd already done 12 months as a residential conveyancer and she's mm. been able to transfer quite quickly into the commercial property mindset so you know the good that there is some grounding and some crossover between those two areas but i think you know as you move forward in your career if if you know the challenges and complexities of commercial property in the broad sphere of mm. that area of the law are something that you think is going to keep you interested and keep you challenged and keep you you know wanting to learn and know more and you know develop your skill set then you know that's that's going to be the area for you if yeah. you like a challenge yeah definitely no i can i i definitely that's what people tell me about the commercial property and like you said especially if you're doing the the thorny things into like agriculture and um that sort of things as well which is obviously big business around here in east anglia so um so no that's great and um what have you seen what would you say over the course of your career from when you started in that little high street practice to mm. where you are now what would you see as the big sort of key developments in the in the area of law or maybe just in the way you're working i mean you've, you've obviously worked in-house and private practice so that's just mm. a big change in itself but anything across the board that sort of had an impact on your working day or your working life you know that's I mean generally obviously since COVID um the way that we work it, it is changing and is different although it's interesting who you talk to because some people are now sort of being urged to go back into the office mm. um you know uh, certainly here we've taken the approach and the view on consultation with all of our staff that hybrid working is the way forward and it's something that we will continue to be able to offer mm. um people who work for us you know for the considerable uh future um 
you know, and being able to, you know, as a manager, as a line manager, managing your team in those circumstances can, can be quite challenging. So it's really important, particularly with juniors, in order to bring them on, that we dedicate time to that. Um, and my team work in a really collaborative way. We're constantly having sort of little just touch ups, mm. uh, uh, you know, catch catch ups and touch points during the week. Um, so we all know what's going on and we can help <laughs> each other out if we need to. Um, in particular, within the commercial property sphere, um, certainly from around 2015 onwards, when you had the introduction of the sort of minimum energy efficiency regulations, you know, EPCs, yeah, you know, can't, yeah. can't let property below a certain level. And we're moving from that into sort of green leases and more uh, ESG uh, type of, you know, that, that's mm -hmm. that's sort of the driver here, you know, and the, the commitment to, to carbon reduction is being pulled uh, mm -hmm. from us, obviously the government's into, into legal documents and we need to know how that's going to work and going to affect our clients long term particularly when they're taking sort of long-term uh, leasehold interests we've also got things uh, like biodiversity net gain which are impacting uh, the residential developers and the work mm -hmm. that we do there so is that's... this this I, I think this is what I was thinking of when you were speaking is that like where you have to have 10 percent net gain in terms of our, in order to do the building or something you need to offset the carbon from the development so okay. um it, it i mean in in broad terms it means that developers either need to include within their development plan land that's sufficient enough to offset the carbon of the development which means retaining lots of green space which of course means losing potential developable areas mm -hmm. um or they need to offset that by acquiring and retaining uh land somewhere else um okay. you know in broad terms obviously it's a lot more complicated yeah than that, yeah but, yeah um i suppose or, but, but back back in the day there was no no considerations along these lines no I mean, sort of environmental yeah i mean the, the the, there was always planning conditions that applied uh, uh, you know things like sustainable drainage systems things like that but and then mm. they've obviously had you know all the affordable housing requirements to consider so if you imagine the squeeze on developers at the minute they've got you know all of these other things impacting and then landowners holding out for ridiculous land prices i think you know we're going to start to see the sort of pipeline of developable projects uh, unless someone comes up with an innovation to try and you know um get this sort of moving and to, mm. to help the development process it's you've got the competing um we need to build more homes yeah against the yes but we we've got to be carbon neutral and and those um factors are sort of you know they don't sit well together and so mm -hmm. we as lawyers have a you know we're trying to work with our clients uh to come up with you know potential solutions but ultimately it's going to you know come down to um the, the pricing and the driver uh, and whether mm, or not the yeah. you know the government's prepared to to intervene any further than it is but i can't see how it how it can yeah yeah that's the th yeah it's all in the balance i suppose and so yeah i mean i guess then looking into the future what do you think would might be sort of key developments in the future or things that you can see coming down the line already i mean it's quite hard when these things are led by the government and you know where where we are in terms of election year and all the rest of it as well but uh... I mean, the one that I have really got my eye on, because, you know, um, I'm mostly a, primarily a landlord and tenant lawyer, is the Law Commission's review of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954, which obviously has been around <laughs> 70 years, has been protecting business tenants. You know, it was last reviewed in 2003 when we had the regulatory reform, um, uh, when all the sort of contracting out procedure uh, came into effect. But they are looking at it again because uh, they are are concerned about sort of the dwindling high streets they're concerned that a number of landlords are effectively saying look we literally just won't grant you a lease uh, mm. unless you contract out so the whole purpose and thrust and drive of the 54 act which has been serving landlords and tenants really well um since the 1950s is sort of being subverted by commercial means but it's again it's that question of whether the government should interfere with commercial mm. realities i mean i think the the driver behind it is sensible because obviously the it, it, the purpose of the act is to protect the commercial interest of tenants who are filling our shops who are you know who we want to see there and you know mm -hmm. but it's balancing that with the the landlord's interest as well um you know we've had recent case law literally in the last month about you know the 54 act and landlords being able to uh take back property on redevelopment's grounds so that's quite a new novel case that's just been out it's the sainsbury's case so the law is constantly changing so even with this piece of legislation that is you know from the 1950s 
there are always new interpretations and new cases where you know they sort of fine tune it tweak it you know somebody looks at it with a different hat on and comes up with a slightly different conclusion but certainly for me you know the volume of leases that legislation is you know sort of bread and butter to us and mm-hmm. you know it's something you learn from day one at law school so <laughs> redrafting that is just going to impact everything I suppose if they actually be really, go that far yeah. it'll be really interesting to see I mean the the deadline for it's already been push back but it's now expected in autumn this year so watch this space right, right gosh yeah there we go and that's the thing isn't it where you have the fundamentals of the law based on something so historic like that and then everything set up for it a simple mm-hmm. change is not a simple change <laughs> well you know and again you know all of the leases that i've drafted in my almost 20 years you know whether they're inside or outside the act if they're if they're inside and the legislation changes again is it going to apply retrospectively Mm, and mm. the impact of that on decision making at you know and end of lease terms and everything else is is going to be really interesting so Mm, yeah mm. watch this space there we go there we go no that's all fascinating stuff all fascinating stuff and it shows even when the law is old as it is in lots of areas lots of fields of law actually there's still so much change and so much development like you say always tweaking fine-tuning redefining and all the rest of it so it's it shows how non-static these areas of law are even when the bedrock is ancient sort of thing you know so no exactly you know it it being a commercial property lawyer you're all you're constantly having to read up and see what the changes are and there's always changes to some area uh mm-hmm. you know within within where you're working so uh, but that's one of the reasons why i love it because you know every day is a new challenge <laughs> excellent excellent well it's been brilliant speaking to you i think your enthusiasm for property law really does come across <laughs> which is what is great i mean i'm Thank not you. saying every minute of every day but you know <laughs> yeah in the main I can see how you're passionate about it and that's so great so um so yeah thanks for coming and sharing that with us you are very welcome anytime thank you very much take care thanks bye